So thank you all again for being here tonight uh, to learn more about the Bitterroot Water Forum's proposal, uh, Roots Against Erosion, which we're working on with the uh, City of Hamilton for a project out at the Skalkaho Bend Park. And so with that, I will get um, my screen shared here so you can see some of our photos on this. And let's see. Okay, sharing screen. And here we go. So, Habitat Improvement and Roots Against Erosion, Revegetation at Skelcoho Bend Park. So we'll start with, you know, we want to tell everyone tonight why we think this project should be done, um, why we think it's the best possible approach for the park, uh, how we came to the proposal that we did, and why we suggest it be done in the near future to help protect the park. So a little history and background. Um, this is some lovely drone footage that Katie took of the Scalcoho Bend Park. And you can see when you're looking at this place, it's really noticeable from this vantage point um, that there's really not a strong native plant community that exists here at the park. Certainly not like we see um, downstream at River Park or even upstream from this area. And so you can actually see, because of this, you can see um, visible erosion occurring. So even today, you know, we were out there um, with some city council folks, and um, even again, you could see big chunks of bank that had fallen off, um, eroded into the river. And you can see in that soil, there's just no roots, um, no root systems holding that bank in place. So it is actively eroding into the river. And so we decided we needed to get some scientists involved, um, some resource professionals, hydrologists, biologists, geomorphologists, botanists. We wanted to see what is going on at this site and what can possibly be done to help prevent this rapid erosion. And so we got folks together um, and GM um, Environmental Consulting, which we're very lucky to have here in Hamilton, um, but GM Environmental Consulting, we started working with them. And Marissa Souls there um, put this really neat map together for us. And so this shows just how much the Bitterroot moves. I mean, anyone who has spent time near it knows this much. <laughs> the Bitterroot is an incredibly dynamic river. And so we wanted to get a better sense for what was going on um, around the Skelcoho Bend Park. And so we had um, Marissa digitize these river channels. And so, so you can see in 1954, that sort of greenish yellow, um, a lot more of the river was sort of over on the West Channel. And then you see over time it migrating to the east and actually towards and into that Skalkaho Bend Park. Um, so that the 2017 uh, river channel, you can actually see cutting right into Skalkaho Bend Park, Park, which is the dashed line that you can see there. And so, you know, we looked at this and we said, well, okay, historically, it looks like the river is migrating that way, but what, you know, what's going to happen next? Um, what can we project might happen based on, you know, what we know from the past um, and the information that we have at hand? So GM actually hired uh, a renowned geomorphologist, Karen Boyd, um, with Applied Geomorphology out of Bozeman. And Karen Boyd worked with GM um, to help, again, take it all into context. So we know it's a dynamic river. Um, we know it's moving towards the park. We can see that. But how much can we expect it to continue moving um, and why? So based on factors upstream, downstream, the vegetation, this, that, and the other. So when Karen looked at this, the results were really telling. So you can see that the 95 bank line uh, is incredibly different than the 2017 bank line. And in some spots moved at, uh, you know, over 100 or 180 feet of bank uh, that was lost as the river migrated east. And so, you know, 22 years, you're seeing an average of between four to eight feet per year of erosion at this site. And so the yellow light um, yellow line here indicates where Karen then projected, based on all of the science that she had available and what we know about this dynamic river, um, that the bank line by 2040 would extend by as much as that yellow line there. 
And so this was obviously concerning to those of us who love this park um, and want this you know, place available for ourselves and, and our kids and our dog walks. So, you know, looking at, this is the Scalcoho Bend Park outline, uh, we really saw that pinch point there. And so standing there, it you have that nice wide open space, but when you look at it aerially, aerially uh, you start to think about how that river's moving east and that pinch point and what might happen to the park. So working with these scientists, um, our projects committee, you know, which has uh, fisheries biologists, the hydrologist, you know, working with GM, uh, talking with Donnie Raymer, um, the parks director for the city of Hamilton, you know, over the course of years, we said, you know, something really needs to be done, you know, to preserve this park. So we thought, well, what, well, what can we do? And uh, here's an all too familiar picture um, for people uh, who live around and play around the Bitterroot. Um, we said, what can we do? Uh, rip wrap? No. Uh, we don't want to do anything like this out at the park. Um, we want to do a, an approach that is uh, natural, um, that preserves the natural amenity while giving the park a chance against erosion. This is anything but natural, and this is what we see um, as a last-ditch effort, what people are doing to protect infrastructure, you know, when when you don't have time to be proactive and plan ahead. And so this is not something that the Bitterroot Water Forum would recommend. Um, this is not great for the resource. It's not good for the habitat. And it's incredibly expensive beyond being um, not a good ecological choice. Uh, riprap is incredibly expensive. And so to riprap the extent of the bank, which you would have to do so that the project wouldn't cut in above or below where you uh, start or stop the riprap, um, we estimate to be, you know, about a half million dollar project. So looking at that, we said, no, riprap, that, that doesn't seem like the right alternative for this place. And so what about a vegetated bank? This is something that the Water Forum has had success in, in places like Rye Creek. Uh, and we've seen this in um, some other areas. And we talked with GM about something like this, a vegetated approach. Some people call this softer stabilization um, as opposed to riprap, the hard stabilization. And it was determined that this would not work um, along this segment of the Bitterroot River. There's just entirely too much flow, too much pressure from the river along that bank, and there would not be enough time for that vegetation to establish um, along the stream to actually be effective. Um, so you need to have those roots established, you need the plants there. As Chris Clancy says, that first high water is really telling and, when, and can do the most detriment to a project, and there just wasn't time to do something like this. The roots might not establish and too much flow. So that was not an alternative that we recommended either. And another alternative being do nothing. Wait. Let the river continue to erode the bank and look out to what we believe the 2050 bank line might be and lose most of Scalcoho Bend Park that we've all uh, grown to love. So doing nothing and watching uh, the river erode away the park uh, did not seem like an alternative that we wanted um, to explore any further either. And so what did we wanna do? We wanted to find a happy medium. We wanted to protect the park protect people's ability to access and enjoy that amenity, um, provide some habitat, and restore the area to a more natural state with healthy riparian plants that allow for a more natural process. Um, erosion over time, letting that river move, not stopping it dead in its tracks, um, but finding something that kind of fits the bill for multiple objectives. And so what you see here um, is a beautiful artist rendering of the restoration design for Skelkoho Bend Park. And, and we'll go into the more detailed design as well, but it's a little easier to see on this one. So um, this is the, the rough restoration design. Um, this is what we're proposing to the city of Hamilton and what we developed in partnership with Donnie Raymer, the park's director. So he was part of this every step of the way in trying to figure out what was really the best approach to this park. And so this was a multi-year, multi-iteration proposal um, that started vastly bigger than this um, with multiple channels and more trees. And, and this was kind of the slimmed down version that we recognized better fit 
the needs of the park and the park users. So reducing the amount of trees that were planted um, to improve the viewshed while still having this really thick line of plant defense. So the green strip there um, is, that's the roots against erosion. That's our woody riparian defense strip. Um, so this will be uh, run the length of what a lot of us call, you know, the park as we know it, although there's a lot more park property uh, to the north and south of just this piece, um, but it will run the length of this piece here. So almost 1500 feet um, so that we can run right along where that bank is actively eroding into the park. And so uh, what will this look like? Well, it's going to be sort of an excavated depression where we plant mostly willows and some cottonwoods, but 97% willows, which again, like I said, is to really get those roots against erosion rather than um, having plants that are too tall and may impair the viewshed. So what you see on the left is an example of an existing swale at Scalcoho Bend Park. And so you can see in that depression, there are a couple of plant species that you don't see in other areas of the park. So we want to encourage that. We want to dig this depression um, and then plant it, really densely plant it um, with willows, like I said, 97%, and some cottonwoods and aspens um, to provide that habitat. Um, but really it's about those root systems. So digging into that swale, and then we'll have a really robust, vegetated area um, that looks incredibly natural, lush and green, is home to birds and wildlife, but more importantly has those roots underground, which are helping to um, protect Salgoho Bend Park and provide strength against future erosion. So there will be logs and brush embedded into the ground, which will help water actually seep into the ground and infiltrate rather than running just through that swale. We will have a fence around this planting area to keep those plants protected um, from wildlife pressure. So we do see obviously a lot of deer and moose running around this valley um, and we want to keep these plants safe when we put them in the ground. So we will have a fence up until those plants are able to fend for themselves and we can take the fence down and they can withstand uh, getting munched on a little bit um, by some wildlife. There will of course be gaps in that fencing that will allow for wildlife migration and footpaths to allow people to kind of cut through uh, that swale. So it won't be contiguous. There will be breaks um, for people and wildlife to get through. And so someday, this is um, a different project area, obviously, um, but someday we'll have something like this, a really thick, lush, green area um, that's fenced in and protected um, that will grow really mostly these willow shrubs that shouldn't be more than 10 feet tall. Um, and these are some pictures provided by GM to again show it's going to look a little nasty <laughs> when we get started, just to be frank. Um, when you're excavating a trench and planting, um, even as a lot of us have seen in our gardens, it doesn't look great when it gets started. Um, but over time, as the area heals, after we reseed it and plant it and water it and give the plants time to grow, uh, we will see these really nice, thick, lush willows coming in there um, to help enhance the park. And so there will still be paths on both sides. So you can see here's the design um, a little bit closer up here. So all of the green kind of represents the planting area. And there will be breaks in the fencing. So a break here, a break here. And we just, in talking with some uh, folks who live around the area and city council, we want to add another, another place to cross the swale right about in here. And so um, this will be a dense line of vegetation through the park um, that will hopefully help prevent the erosion as the river meets this planting. And one thing that some of you who are familiar with the park right now might notice is the path as it exists. So we see the parking lot up here and the path as it exists comes down in this way. Here is um, the ADA trail here which again, we're really trying not to impede those views. So keeping those low shrubs, those sort of up uh, to 10 foot at maturity height willows um, with some cottonwoods planted, but you know, sparsely. And we'll be lucky if we see them grow up um, in our lifetimes to any point where they'd obstruct view. But if you come down this ADA trail 
and you walk over this bridge. And as it exists now, you can walk directly to the river. And what we've noticed and what the parks director noticed is the erosion is in incredibly bad um, at this site right here and actually was exacerbated this year we think possibly as the park saw more use and so when GM and Marissa from GM looked at this site again this year we saw almost 10 feet of bank erosion at this specific site and so proposing to to move the path so that we're not directing foot traffic here and continuing to really compact this trail and increase erosion but have the path diverge so you can go south and access uh, the river this way. And this is, as we've all seen, a lot of people go this way because this is actually a nice little kind of swim and fishing hole. This is where a lot of people actually access and get into the river directly. So this will just direct people that way. And as I said, we'll try and add another path right in this way so people can cut through this way or just you know do the loop as it exists on the current kind of connector trail um, around the park there. So the swale will exist between the current footpath, the current trail that the city has been maintaining. So you can still do that nice loop um, around the vegetation and around the plantings. So again, this is what, you know, the design looks like. Um, this is what our swale, kind of the footprint that the swale will take. Um, it's a tremendous boon for the park in terms of developing riparian vegetation and creating these really important root systems. And for all of that, with all that planting, the entire project footprint is only one and a half acres. So it's only about 2% of the 70 acre park um, will actually be modified um, by this project that can ultimately help you know, keep this park here um, for us and for future generations. So, um, that is the design as it stands. That is our proposal. Um, and again, we want to encourage uh, the city and, you know, working with Donnie, um, like I said, he's been uh, on board with this every step of the way. He's helped us modify this design and, and make it the best it can be for the park. Um, we are encouraging the city, you know, to begin implementing this project in spring 2021. And again, that is, you know, giving the plants time to do their thing. So the geomorphologist that GM worked with um, did predict that if the bend continues to migrate, it will likely intercept the CNC ditch on that east side of the park in about 20 years. And so we want to help preserve the park for the people who enjoy it and prevent a situation where an emergency stabilization action uh, might be requested or required to protect infrastructure. Um, and so we don't want to see that riprap. Um, but plants take a while. And so even the geomorphologist, uh, she said right in her technical memorandum, um, no, this doesn't require immediate attention like riprap. The CNC ditch and the infrastructure, you don't need to drop rock in the bank right now. But it would benefit from a softer vegetated approach. And so that's exactly what we're doing. And those plants uh, will need time to grow. And so we are encouraging the city, um, let's get them started soon. Um, the viability of the project is at stake if we don't act sooner rather than later. These plants need time to establish their root systems. Um, so if we get started next spring, we'll give this project the best chance for success. So what comes next? Um, you know, continued education and outreach. We want more people to know about the plans for the park. Um, we'll be working on that throughout the winter. We've been doing, you know, um, you know, leading up to this project. We've had articles in the Valley Republic. Um, announcements on KLYQ radio, on our Facebook, newsletter, email, uh, City of Hamilton Council of the Whole meeting we presented twice and we'll present again tomorrow night. Uh, the City of Hamilton has information on their website. We have tonight's Zoom presentation, of course, and we'll continue that through the winter and beyond. Education is a big part of what the Bitterroot Water Forum does and we want more people to know about why this project um, is being proposed and why we think it's important. So we will have uh, interpretive signage at the park, talk to some counselors about that again today, um, and really making sure that people can interact with these signs and understand why this project is being done, why it's important. Uh, we can't wait someday, hopefully we'll get to have field trips out there um, and have kids, you know, help plant, um, help water the plants, help, you know, see how tall they're getting um, and really interact with um, a project like this on the main stem of the Bitterroot River. 
So um, what's after that? Education outreach, more outreach <laughs> education. Uh, the city will need to vote on this proposal uh, and will then develop an MOU with the Water Forum about how we get this work done. Um, in the meantime, you know, citizens collecting brush and willows to actually be added right into this project. Um, we would hope to break ground in March and April, where we will actually dig the swale and get the plants in the ground. And then it's all about adaptive management in partnership with the city. So like any project the Water Forum does, it's not put the plants in the ground and walk away. It's put the plants in the ground and then figure out how they will best thrive. So that's uh, monitoring and maintenance. So watering, making sure that the plants are thriving, um, fixing fence, making changes as needed uh, to ensure the survival rate of the plants and that the project is doing what it was intended. So again, talked with some counselors today, you know, about what happens next and, and what if the river does meet the fence? Well, that's, we're continuing to stay in dialogue and we will, the water form will be there to support what the next steps are, try to find more funding um, for how we can do what needs to be done to help protect the project and protect the park. So more education for kids and adults, of course, and for as long as we can imagine, continued enjoyment of our park. And so that's going to take a lot of people banding together, um, as it often does with water form projects. And we'll be looking for a lot of volunteers uh, to come out and help us get this um, park planted. Uh, we will be putting lots of plants in the ground, those little willow shoots, which some of you have helped us collect and plant before, um, and installing those throughout the area. So we'll need lots of people power. And that's why another reason we love this um, proposal, the opportunity for people to be involved, um, to be part of the project from, you know, whether it's implementation, you know, putting things in the ground or letting us know what they're seeing on site, um, what they think is working, what might not be, um, to have a community project like this where people can um, let us know what they think about, what they're seeing on the ground. Are there different birds accessing the area? You know, all that. So a really fun opportunity for people to get involved. Um, and these are, you know, not pictures from around here, I'll say as much, uh, but what we are looking for are, plantings like this. So someday these willows will grow up. We'll have this big, lush, very natural looking area. And what you see on the right is just to kind of give a little perspective of kind of when you're looking from up above. So yes, when you're standing next to the willows, um, they will grow to potentially 10 feet tall. Um, but when you're up above, like on the ADA trail and looking out, you'll still be able to see the mountains. You'll still be able to see across the river. We don't want to impede that view. So doing everything we can um, to ensure that that view can still be enjoyed by all the people who are going to love that tremendous ADA trail. And again, kudos to the Land Trust um, for building a trail like that. Um, I have friends and family uh, who can only use that trail and are, are getting a real kick out of it. So it's nice to see that and we don't wanna do anything to impede that view. So again, this is the reason we proposed a project like this, uh, why we think it's really important. And one of the last things I'll say is, you know, in talking with some folks about this, there's varying opinions, of course, like with anything um, about what should or shouldn't be done here. Some people who say, you know, put the rock in the bank, protect the whole park. Some people say, let the river just take it. That's what the river wants to do. And again, we really wanted to find this happy medium. So someone had said once, you know, the city bought a park near the river and they just need to accept that it will change. And while to a certain extent, the water form agrees, we don't think people should be actively trying to just manage the river. Um, we aren't in the business of stopping the river, uh, but we do want to give the park the best chance possible. Because it's lacking the natural vegetation that you see at so many other places along the river, we want to restore it to that to give the park a chance. And I heard someone else make a great analogy, um, likening the purchase of the park to buying a house. So you, you make the purchase with enthusiasm and only after do you maybe realize, you know, with ownership, um, what comes with that and how to best care for the purchase and how complex that can be. And so I'm thinking it's, you know, you go through the inspection, you buy the house, but you find a, maybe a crack in the foundation and you don't just let it be. You find the smartest way to protect your investment, care for the space um, so that you and your family can enjoy it for years to come. So, you know, that's why we've submitted this proposal. Um, that's why we're suggesting that the project be done soon. We really care about this place. I love this park. 
uh, and we want to help the city protect it as best we can. Um, we get to enjoy it now and we want future generations to enjoy it like we are. Um, and that means acting soon. So that's how we came to this conclusion. Um, that's how we submitted this proposal. Um, and with that, we will get into our Q&A. So, oh, there we go. Uh, so thanks everyone for sticking around. Looks like a handful more people joined us, which is great. I'm so happy to have you tonight. And let's see, it looks like people have some questions here. So I'm gonna start getting through the Q&A. And again, if you have to jump off at any point, um, this will be recorded. And we also have the frequently asked questions about some of the questions we have received um, prior we have those posted on our website. So um, this is great. So we have from Delcy here. Okay, this is great. Thank you. Thank you, Delcy. Um, what are your plans to engage park users in the future planning process, including identifying trails, signage, community outreach, we control education? Um, how many active teachers and educators are involved in planning? Great question. So this project, like so many things this year, uh, was adapted in a way. Um, the education and outreach, uh, we didn't get to do the walking tours of the park like we hoped we would. Um, not being able to bring people together like we usually do has been a challenge for us. Um, so continued engagement, trying to get people involved in the process. Um, spoke with someone who helped, um, I think Delcy, you'll know him, uh, helped get the, um, the Billings um, Audubon Center put together there. So talking with people who've been engaged in projects like that about best ways to get community involvement. Um, let's see, future planning process trails. So that'll be uh, work with the city, of course. And so the city is responsible for maintaining those trails around the park as they are now. And of course, as the river moves, um, that's why part of the reason they moved that trail back is they have um, as that continues to move, uh, we'll support the city in modifying the trail system kind of as needed. And talk to the council today about that interpretive signage, um, more community outreach. So yeah, definitely keeping things going out on our email. We have a monthly column now in the Valley Republic. Um, so we'll be revisiting this there. Um, and weed control, an ongoing battle as we all know, um, and we will get volunteers engaged with that. We have a watershed restoration team that helps us with a lot of our plantings um, and will help get out there um, to yeah, do all things adaptive management, um, including looking at weeds, because I know that was a problem and it was in much different shape before the land trust and the city started managing it and got rid of a lot of the weeds that did exist there. Um, how many teachers and educators involved in planning? Um, so we were hoping again to get teachers and uh, classrooms actually out planting, and maybe we still will. We're certainly hoping that we, our dream was to have kids, you know, putting plants in the ground and kind of seeing them as the plants got as tall as they were um, and through their lifetime. So we're continuing to explore ways um, that we can get students involved because we think the education, um, excuse me, opportunities are tremendous here. Um, and so question it all again, so um, why do this project at all? And so again, like we said, um, some people at varying degrees of interest of let the river do its thing or stop it in its tracks. And so we thought this was a nice happy medium to get that park, the plants that will help uh, reduce erosion there. Um, not stopping the river from moving, allowing the river to continue its natural channel migration, um, but again, just giving that park a fighting chance. Um, we've seen a lot of time in the Bitterroot uh, where there isn't time or forethought for sort of proactive measures um, to uh, restore an area, to put in vegetation that might help slow the flow. Um, and then we see people get reactionary and do things that are damaging to the river stream uh, banks, the habitat. We have an opportunity here to be proactive and to hopefully prevent um, some reactionary measure down the line um, as the river continues to erode away at the park and uh, infrastructure is potentially threatened. Um, okay, so let's see, uh, scrolling here. Once the trees and plants become established, will the wildlife fence be removed? 
Yes, it will be. And so the fence is temporary. Um, and uh, let's see if I have, I should have unmuted her before. We have uh, Andrea Price, our restoration coordinator is here. Um, and so we'll see if we can get her unmuted. Um, the fence will be taken down three to five years. Sometimes we've seen it a little bit longer at projects depending on how well the plants are doing and thriving. Um, but once those plants can withstand some browse pressure from deer and elk, uh, we will take that fence down and then it'll look like a really natural uh, swath of willows there. Okay. Okay. What kind of brush are you going to be collecting besides willows? Oop, something. It's my first time actively using a chat screen. So um, somebody put something in the, the last thing you're reading disappears. Okay. Uh, what kind of brush are you going to be collecting besides willows? Uh, so for the woody debris, we have something on our website. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. We're looking for um, bigger logs and we'll be collecting Christmas trees um, from people over the winter. Uh, we need larger pieces of woody debris to help bury into the ground there. Um, and that's important for a couple of reasons. Um, one is there will be water in this channel to help, um, in the swale to help not make it not an active channel. I said channel, um, we have the wood there um, to prevent water from flowing there. So as the plants are being watered, we don't want uh, ever rushing water. So the woody debris will be placed throughout the swale to actually stop water from moving and let it infiltrate into the ground. So we're replacing that throughout the length of the swale and then some at the lower reach of the swale as well. Again, just to keep any water that might pool. Um, if there's big rain events too during this while we're actively watering, we wanna make sure that water infiltrates. So we'll be burying that woody debris in the ground throughout the swale and beyond. Uh, and then the willows will be collected with volunteers. Um, so when you see a big, um, bush of willows, a, bit, uh, a shrub that's really well advanced. You see them oftentimes uh, growing along ditches uh, and sometimes along uh, rivers and streams. Uh, you can cut a lot of those back. And so when we say we're planting a lot of willows, we mean a lot of those cuttings. So we'll get volunteers out um, with us to cut those single shoots that we'll be planting into the banks. Um, so that will be the main type of brush that we're collecting with volunteers. Are you still planning to plant aspens, service berries, and dogwood? So there will be other trees planted. Like I mentioned, willows are the majority of what will be planted here. Um, and we will also have some cottonwoods and likely some aspens. Um, cottonwoods, because they really are good for the river system. They're very natural there. So eventually, um, again, not probably in my lifetime, but eventually they may even be able to provide shade for the stream, which would be a good thing uh, for warming waters. And the aspen uh, were recommended because they're tremendous wildlife, um, so that our wildlife habitat. So they'll be a great boon for the area to add some more habitat in that space that doesn't have as much of that riparian habitat. Um, weed management will be more difficult. Um, true, we're up to the task. Um, and I don't want to be callous about that. It's just, we know weeds, when you disturb an area, become an issue. And this is certainly not something we intend to overlook, um, but rather to keep our volunteers actively engaged in. Um, we have some of our volunteers actually live quite close to the park, which is handy, because sometimes we have them driving all the way out to the East Fork to help with plantings. Um, but this is a lot closer. So I think we'll have some people who are able to get over there more frequently um, to help with some of those. Um, um, and also, Heather, if I could just add, oh, yes, this please. Is, Welcome, Andrea. <laughs> this is Andrea. I'm the restoration coordinator. Um, and in order to combat some of those weeds from colonizing the disturbed areas, um, we will be spreading a native seed mix um, around all disturbed areas that should help keep some of the weeds in check. Thank you, Andrea. Um, yeah, so planting native grasses. Okay, let's see. Okay, we are actively getting through the questions, so keep them coming if you have them. Um, weed control, education, erosion, scroll, scroll. Wildlife fencing removed. Um, in addition to volunteer efforts, 
Um, what do you anticipate is the dollar cost for this project and from which sources? So good question. Another question was, um, yeah, how is this project being funded? Great questions. Um, so this project will not be funded by the city of Hamilton. And that is important, I think, for us to acknowledge. Um, the Water Forum received a grant from the Montana Department of Environmental Quality uh, to assist with this grant. Um, there will also be significant in-kind contributions, as we mentioned, from uh, volunteers, um, from the city, the time that Donnie has spent on this, I guess is an in-kind contribution. Um, and then the volunteers doing the planting, watering, maintenance, and whatnot. Um, Bitterroot Audubon has also generously offered to support this project and has uh, given us a small cash grant um, to put towards this. And uh, how much will it cost? So what we're looking at now, and I have my little spreadsheet around here somewhere. Andrea might be quicker to the... Um, we're looking at um, for the actual hard costs of planting and swale, um, we're looking at just over $100,000. And so that is for the materials excavator. Um, that's our oversight work with GM. Um, and actually, these numbers are too small. Um, this is part one of my spreadsheet. So it will be over $100,000 um, when we take into account um, time spent by uh, GM oversight with the water forum. Um, with our contractor costs. Yeah, so our, our grant, thankfully, from DEQ, which also funds education and outreach, which is really neat that the state helps put money towards that. So our interpretive signage, um, education and outreach, time spent, things like this. Um, our grant from DEQ was just over $120,000. Um, and so that will be just invested right back into the park. Um, and again, without the city dollars. So that's why we're really encouraging this to be done in a way like this. Um, if it were to be rip wrap or something sort of down the road, um, that would be a hard cost that the city would have to bear alone um, and that the water forum could not, would not, um, you know, put money into a rip wrap style project. Um, I kind of may have a question he sent you about cost. Okay, yep, just kind of a question about cost. Um, okay, here. Um, changing grasslands and bird habitat, because like we said, um, it'll only affect about one and a half acres, um, which is only 2% of the 70 acre park. Um, yeah, who is involved in, um, this is another frequently asked question, um, who is involved in this? So we mentioned GM Environmental Consulting, who you should check out their website if you don't know them, have been involved in tremendous um, high ticket, high impact uh, projects all throughout the Intermountain West. Um, really extensive resume there from GM. They just happened to be in Hamilton. Um, but yeah, uh, we worked with GM, uh, applied geomorphology out of Bozeman. Um, like I said, the Water Forum, we've been doing projects for over 10 years, um, which is exciting uh, here in the Valley. Uh, fisheries biologists, hydrologists, and research scientists on our board helped us develop this plan. Uh, Donnie Raymer, of course, with the city of Hamilton, helped us develop this proposal. Um, and DEQ supports this project proposal. Um, there's a letter of support that was submitted to the city and is on their website about that. Um, we talked about the view shed. So I think we, we covered that. Again, that, that is really important to us and that's part of the adaptive management to minding those plants. Um, yeah, and when would the project be implemented? Um, so, that is something we would encourage to be uh, next spring. So still going through the public process. There's been weeks of the public process. I'm going back to a city council meeting tomorrow. Um, and then, yeah, the time, ideal timeline with construction beginning in spring 2021. Um, and then hopefully see plants growing next uh, spring and summer. Let's see. Okay. And I think that gets to the questions that we had in the chat here. So again, if you're on the phone still, and um, if we still have you, don't forget to email Katie with any questions that you have, k-a-t-i-e at brwaterforum.org. Um, we do have those FAQs on the website. We have a white paper on the website, some more maps. Uh, the city of Hamilton has some resources on their website as well under current pro uh, project proposals. Um, Let's see, and I think that covers uh, everything for tonight. If you think of anything else uh, after the fact, of course, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, got a new message coming in. Um, will that portion of the park be open during construction? Great question. Um, and, you know, 
I imagine we don't want to keep the have the park closed at all if we don't have to. Um, and we were just talking today about even the access there. We're not going to have the world's biggest excavator come in uh, that bridge what it will sustain. You know, we need machinery that will get through there. Um, so yes, I want to say yes, it will be open because we don't want to keep Scalco Bend Park closed for a moment. Um, we might need to reroute you a little bit and maybe put up some temporary sort of caution tape uh, to keep people away um, from the construction. But absolutely, we want people to be able to access and use that um, indefinitely. So we'll just maybe skirt people around and put up those temporary signs about what we're doing, why, what to expect over the course of weeks as we're uh, doing the implementation um, so that people hopefully are never too surprised during the process. So keeping signage up there, um, there's a beautiful sign um, up beyond the first Scalcoho Bend park sign when you first pull into the park on um, that, that beautiful heron. Uh, but on the interior there right before you get on the trail um, there's a little map there and so we can likely you know keep updated information there about the construction schedule so people can plan accordingly i know my dog uh, never loved loud sounds so uh, some people might want to keep away for a few days when we do have the the louder things going up okay great plan thanks good luck thank you frank um and please address the question about cottonwoods um yes there will be cottonwoods yeah, we do intend to have some cottonwoods um, placed throughout there. Um, again, just because they're great in that river bottom habitat. Um, they are uh, someday, hopefully, great shade for the stream, like I said, a long ways from now. And I think um, it's good to note, um, so the cottonwoods, if folks are familiar with uh, River Park, just downstream, there were old cottonwoods along the bank. And at some point, um, some older cottonwoods were actually cut down. Uh, and there were some new ones planted. So set off the bank, much like we would do, uh, there's been a planting of cottonwoods there at River Park. And they're spaced so that when you're standing far away, you can see right through them, they're small enough. Um, and we'll do something like that. And they planted trees. And I talked to Jenny West today, she, I think it was six, seven, eight years ago, uh, maybe that they planted the trees. And they're not huge. Um, but they're there um, to be the good habitat uh, that should exist along the river. So there will be some cottonwoods. And as we mentioned today on a tour with some council members, when you're looking from the ADA trail especially, imagine it's not that there will be cottonwoods like just a big cottonwood in front of your tree, full grown, um, in, full, in front of your face. But as you're looking out the vantage point, there will be sort of some sticks of cottonwood kind of in the distance. So um, we likened it to, yeah, you're at a concert, you're not set behind a pillar, but it's sort of just like maybe way up ahead, there's one tall guy that you can kind of see around. So um, yeah, there will be some, some cottonwoods there. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone for showing up tonight. Um, don't forget, you can check out our website or call us, email us with any future questions. Um, we'd love to hear from you on this and really look forward to working with the community on this project. So thank you all for coming out. Um, this will be available on our website. Um, and with that, yeah, have a great night. Thank you all. Take care. Stay safe. Be well. I wish we were, you know, together, but this works for now. So thank you all. Take care. Be in touch. Bye.